Romania, 1991. Maybe you remember the fall of Ceausescu and you remember all the publicity of uh, orphanages being discovered by by the West and by the media here and, and the horror which we realised that so many children in Romania have been abandoned in orphanages. And they were lying there, um, lying often uh, in their own filth, lying uncared for. Uh, I was in an orphanage, uh, several orphanages, and one one of them I remember walking into a room and it was wall to wall with cots and children just lying in them and and a sea of cots uh, and these poor uh, abandoned children. And then perhaps you remember not uh, a case of orphanages but something worse than parents who would abandon their children but an abusive parent. Maybe you remember the story because it's been back in the news again of Joseph Fritzl who in 2008 uh, was discovered to have kept his, his daughter in a cellar for 24 years. He had assaulted her, abused her, and fathered seven children with her. Three, man's wife didn't know about this, but three were taken then upstairs and, and lived with the family. One died uh, in, in infancy or in childbirth, and three of the children lived with their mum in the cellar. For years. After uh, they were discovered and released, a poster was put up by the daughter and the family to thank locals for the support. And on that poster, uh, the eight year old said that he was enjoying the sun and fresh air and nature for the first time. All they had known was the cellar. They didn't know life was so different. The cellar was norm, the normal for them, normality. And in a sense it's true of all of us. We were born to an abusive parent. They were locked up in a cellar downstairs. There was downstairs life. That was it. We had a single story existence. We were tricked into thinking that this life, this little box that we are in of this world was all that there is and that there was no second story. There was no upstairs. There was no more to life than here and now. And then God did something wonderful. God rescued us from the cellar and he brings us out into the fresh air and we experience what it is to know what life is all about for the first time. And he does more than that. He brings us into his family. Brings us into a new family. And here is something of the wonder of becoming a Christian. Last time, as we looked at the catechism, we saw ourselves in God's courtroom. And we heard the verdict of the day of judgment resounding forward in time to our ears. And we heard him declare not guilty. But he hasn't left us to fend for ourselves. He hasn't sort of said, right, you're free to go now, and we walk out of the courtroom and, and well, what do we do? What do we do? No. He comes down out of uh, his judge's bench, so to speak, and he puts his arm around our shoulder and he says, come with me now. And he takes us, not to McDonald's to buy us a burger, and then send us on our way, but he takes us home to his place, to his family to his living room. And we find ourselves this evening in God's living room. And this speaks to something in our world that is poignant. It speaks to that need that we have to belong to something. And in a world of social media where everybody has all social networks, but people are becoming increasingly isolated and lonely, this is all the more clear to us that we are made to be connected and to belong. And that longing is like, it's almost like a, a, a compass needle in our hearts that is pointing somewhere that we are made to belong. And it's pointing us to Christ and his work and bringing us into God's family. It speaks also to a world in which there are broken families and abusive 
parents and in particular abusive fathers. But all of us need to grasp this wonderful truth that we're thinking of this evening of adoption. Christians easily forget how they should view God. We become coloured by our own experience and our own interpretation of our experience. We see God in, 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 in dark ways at times. We can become stuck seeing God through the lens of our experience, maybe through the lens of our own father. Or we become stuck in, in court and we're seeing God still up there with his judge's robes on. And so we come to our catechism question and answer. Previously, we asked the question, what benefits do those who are effectively called share in this life? In this life, those who are effectively called share justification, adoption, sanctification, and the other benefits that either go with them or come from them. And we looked last time at what is justification. We looked this time at what is adoption. Adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and of a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Wow. You and me received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Into the number of the sons of God and a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. And we want to think about three things uh, this evening. Because adoption, as I've said in the notice, is, is the great forgotten truth of Christianity. Something that we lose track of, lose sight of. I want to think, first of all, about adoption's cost, and then adoption's privileges, and then adoption's impact. First of all, adoption's cost. Um, and we need to tie it back to what Christ has done. Because adoption is a costly affair. I have an aunt and uncle who adopted uh, a little girl from Russia and they had to go there uh, many times and, and do a lot of paperwork and, and put themselves to a huge expense to, to adopt this little girl. It's costly. But God went to a far greater expense. And we, we thought of it this morning as we thought of what Christ has done in suffering for us, but let's touch on it again. Think of it this way, the son left home. He left his family, left the father, as it were, and left the spirit, although the spirit comes to enable him and to equip him. But he leaves the comfort of heaven. He left where he belonged to, to take us where we had no right to be. He left where he belonged to take us to where we had no right to be. That's the cost. He embraced limitation so that we could embrace freedom. He was forsaken so that we could be accepted. The sinless son. Think about it. The sinless son became sin so that sinful people could become sons. The sinless son became sin so that sinful people could become sons. And the father looked on the son as we saw this morning with undiluted wrath so that we could be the recipients of undiluted love. This is why we, we daren't, daren't forget about this truth, because this privilege and blessing of being adopted into God's family comes at the most immense of costs. He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. In Galatians 4, we read in verse 4, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption to sonship. 
so that we might become sons. Now, what an answer our catechism question has. Received into the number and of a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. All those privileges are purchased by the Son for us. And this is our great privilege. You know, the idea that all human beings are all God's children is, is a nonsense. We're all his creation. But the Old Testament and the New Testament reserve the title of the children of God. The Old Testament, it's those who come from Abraham's line and those who come into the people of God. And in the New Testament, it's those believers who come to Christ. They're the ones that get to call God Father. We're not naturally sons. We're naturally rebels. But we can be adopted as sons. Adoption's cost. Secondly, adoption's privileges. Adoption's privileges. We're in the living room. Come, come with me in your mind's eye to, to a living room of, 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 a, of a family. And there's the father. And the father's delighting in his children. And they're, they're laughing and they're joking together. He's playing with them. There's another child doing homework and the father goes over and he's helping them with their homework so they can grow, so in their understanding. There's the father working to provide for his children. There's the father planning for their welfare. There's a howl comes from outside and you look out the window and you see there's a little girl who's has fallen, coming running down the, 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 the pathway, and she skinned her knee. And as you're looking out the window, you see the father has run out, and he's scooped her up in his arms, and he's wiping away the tears from her eyes, and he's, he's caressing the scuffed knee, and he's, he's rubbing it, and he's, he's going to put a bandage on it. He's caring. And then there's some other child, and they're blethering about the most inconsequential nonsense. And the older children, what's the father doing? Tell me. Tell me about that. Then there's a few other children, and well, they need discipline and they need training, but the father loves them enough to do that too. That's the living room of the home. And that's the room that we're in uh, this evening. And it's actually it's the room that if you're a Christian, that's the room that you live in. You don't live in the courtroom. The judge has taken you home and he's adopted you. And he said, call me daddy. Adoption is the greatest privilege that you have. We think, uh, we think surely, surely being in the courtroom and being told we're not guilty is a great privilege. But, but this is higher and deeper. In the courtroom, you know God is judge. But now... You know him as father. And it's higher because it's a deeper, richer relationship that is involved. Uh, justification is the foundation. Adoption is the house that's built that you get to live in. It's not the relationship of a servant to a master. It's the relationship of a son to a father. In Galatians 4, verse 7, we read, So you are no longer a slave. But Let me give it to you in the ESV. I have a bone to pick with the NIV. ESV, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. The, the NIV, the new NIV has... You are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Child. Makes, yeah. The word is son. And that's a precious word. It's not a sexist word. God has one son. And the Bible is careful to call us sons so that we grasp that we, we are his 
sons, just like, as we'll say in a moment, just like the son is a son. A child seems, you know, something that could be dismissed. But son. We know how God the Father reacts to his son. And so here is encouragement for us. Adoption's privileges then point us, first of all, to the fact that you are loved. And we could spend all evening in this. In fact, that's, that's what I had intended to do. And then I thought, well, no, 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 there are more privileges than this. So we can only pass ever so quickly and lightly over these. It really should be a series. But you are loved. And Jesus says in John sixteen twenty seven, the Father himself loves you. Do you need to hear that this evening? Here's a privilege of being adopted. The Father himself loves you. He says that to the disciples on the night when they're all about to run. He knows what they're going to do. And yet he assures these disciples that the Father himself, even though they're about to run from the Son, and the Son's weakest hour of weakness, the Father loves them. John 17, 23, he underlines it further. One of the most spectacular verses in the Bible. That you love them even as you have loved me. That the, the Father loves us in the same way, to the same amount, to the same degree as he loves the Son. That you, you bag of dust, are loved as much as the eternal Son of God. Is that not incredible? You have the Father's love. You, you are loved. And it's a gracious love. It's an act of God's free grace. And it's a long love. I was trying to think this evening uh, of an example. And well, the examples are quite simple. Let, let's take Eva. She's not here so we can pick on her. I... She's, what, I think 20 and a half almost to the day. I think that's right. And she has loved me for probably, well, optimistically, 20 of those years. Probably the first six months, there probably wasn't too much uh, figuring out and loving going on there. But we'll, we'll, we'll give her 20 years. But I've loved her for 20 and a half years and nine months. I've loved her longer. But God tells us. Ephesians 1, verse 3, that he loved us before creation. I, know, I didn't know what Eva would be like. But I loved her from the moment you, we knew she was coming. But God did know you and me. And he loved us. Is that not the most astonishing thing? Jeremiah 31, 3, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And it's an incredibly deep, deep love. The father had only one son. And that son was uniquely lovely. And he gave him to us. He gave that son to the cross for us. Sinclair Ferguson writes, you would almost think that the father loved us more than he loved the Son. It's a deep, deep love. And it's an equal love. You know, some parents have favourite children. One of the great uh, difficulties in an adoptive family is, is that adopted children feel loved to the same degree as the natural born children. But we're told here in Galatians 3.28 we read that we are all one in Christ, whether we are Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, you're all one in Christ. You're all sons, it's going to go on and say. It's an equal love. Oh, you're loved. Uh, let's, let's move on to another privilege. You belong. In a world where there is a, a lack of belonging, you belong somewhere. And because you belong somewhere, you know who you are. In 1 John 3 verse 1 it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us. Lavished on us. That's back to love again. That you should be called children of God. 
And then he says, and that is what we are. That's who we are. That's where you belong. You mightn't fit in in this world. You mightn't fit in in your school. You mightn't fit in in your family. You might feel uh, that you you stand out and you, you don't fit in. This is where you belong. In Psalm 68, we're told about the God who sets people in his family. And isn't it wonderful we see the truth of this when we meet Christians from other places and other countries and we've got an instant connection with them. They, we, they feel like family because they belong and we belong. That's one of our great privileges. Another great privilege, you have access. You have access to the Father. You can come to him at any time. You don't need to make an appointment. You think of of, uh, some great high-powered CEO of a company and people have to make appointments and schedule meetings with them and then there's some little child and they can just run into the office, chat away. They don't make an appointment because they're a son or a daughter of the CEO. They have access. So it is with us. In Romans 5, 1, Paul talks about therefore having been justified, we have access. And you can come to him. And because you have access, you find that you're cared for. You can come to the God who made the universe. You have a fast track into his presence. Other people can can cry out and pray, but they have no guarantee of being listened to. But you, as a son or a daughter, are guaranteed to be heard. And you are cared for. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 that we have a Father who provides for us. The birds are provided for by their Creator. But how much more will our Heavenly Father provide for us? He's only their Creator, but He's our Father. And so He cares. You grasp what it is to be cared for? Do you need reminded that he cares for you? In Psalm 103, we sang of such pity as a father has unto his children dear. Like pity shows the Lord to such as worship him in fear. And then a beautiful line that we didn't sing. For he remembers that we are dust. And he our frame well knows. A good father knows how much to push a child. To develop them. And how much to hold back so that he doesn't crush them. And sometimes we think that the burdens that come our way from God are too much. They're too much. They're going to crush us. But no, he's a good father who cares. And who listens. That's why when we pray, we say, Our Father in heaven. And we come to him and say, Give us this day our daily bread. Because he cares about our trials. He's a God who knows. He knows, you know, whenever you're, you're tightening a, a, a screw into a, a piece of furniture or tightening a nut on a bolt uh, and you put too much pressure on it and you strip the threads. Just a little bit less would have been okay. And you regret putting... God never reaches the point where he stripped your threads. He will not test you beyond what you can bear, but will provide a way for you to stand up under it. This is the privilege of having such a father, of being adopted. And you have an an enabling. He is the one who will enable you to, to stand, who will enable you to keep going in Romans 8. And verse 13, we're told that we have the Spirit in us, enabling us to obey and to walk in God's ways. By the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. In Philippians 4, 13, or sorry, verse 26 rather of that that chapter, uh, we're told. Verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Philippians 4, 13. That we can do all things through him who strengthens us. We have a father who enables us to, to do. You know, sometimes when I was working with my dad, um, there were things that he would give me to do when I was a small boy and I couldn't do them. 
What would he do? He would come along and he would come alongside and he would help so that I could work with him, so that I could make things with him. He enabled me to do what he was asking me to do. Mark, go and mix some cement. I don't know how to start the cement mixer. And he would come and start it. And he would come and help you shovel the sand and the, the cement into the cement mixer. And we have a father who likewise works alongside his children to enable them to do what he tells them to do. And you have an inheritance. Oh, you have an inheritance. You know, did you, did you hear in Romans 8 uh, where we're told that we have this inheritance, uh, that we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ? We had it again in Galatians chapter 4, that we are heirs. Heirs? What's been left to you by your parents? Might be a lot. Remember the building fund? Mightn't be very much at all. Mightn't be very much at all. In fact, they might have left you debts. Oh, but you've been adopted into a family. You know, there, there was a great line that, that I read uh, I, I read this evening. Um, and it, it was referring to the streets of heaven and the description being paved with gold. And the guy wrote this. Your feet shall be set on that which the men of this world set their hearts. You will walk, as it were, in streets of gold. The very thing that everybody here says, Oh, that's what I've set my heart on. Your inheritance will be in God's presence forever with riches and glory beyond anything that you could imagine. You have an inheritance. This is your privilege. You may have nothing in this world. But you have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. And so here, here are some of the privileges that belong to you. You are loved, you belong, you have access to the Father, you are cared for, you are, have an, you are enabled to live for him, you have an inheritance. We could throw in there also in this family, you have a brother who loves you, who dies for you, who prays for you, who reigns over all things. For your good, you have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father, and the Holy Spirit assures you that you belong to the Father, and the Holy Spirit loves the Son, and He is shaping you so that you will be like the Son. This is what it is to belong. J.I. Packer has this great quote. He says, In this world, royal children have to undergo extra training and discipline which other children escape in order to fit them for their high destiny. It is the same thing with the children of the King of Kings. You've got a high destiny. Oh, here's what it is. And then, then thirdly, adoption's impact. Adoption's impact. It's transformative. It's transformative. I think of children I know that have been adopted that whose, whose parents were unable to look after them and now they're being cared for and provided for and they're thriving. It's transformative. J.I. Packer uh, says this, If you want to find out how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and of having God as his father. Then he says this, If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life. It means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. It's got to have an impact. It's got to have an impact. It should have an impact for this love. And let me, let me make four applications. This changes how you see God. Do you see God as uh, a shopkeeper that you go in and say well I've done this, this and this and now you owe me this, this and this and if you're not happy with the goods that he is offering then you storm out in a huff never to enter that shop again for a long time well, sometimes that's how people see God perhaps we've been guilty of seeing God that way well I didn't like what I got from him so I'm just ignoring him for a while you get no more of my business for a a day or two? Or do we see God as, as like a, 
a master, a slave master, where we've got to do all these things and do all these things, and then maybe, maybe he'll be happy with us and give us a little break. But maybe I better do more. Do more to impress him. Oh no. He's a father. He's a father. You know, come into the living room. Do you see the children in this living room, in God's living room, saying, excuse me, sir, we will wash your car and we will hoover uh, the, the, the study and we will um, clean the drains and the showers from all the long hair that has accrued over. And in return, will you give us breakfast? Do they barter with their father in this living room? No. no. Do, do they flinch when he comes in because they know he's, he's going to just clip them on the way past for no good reason? No. He's a father. Oh, how we need to remember this because, because circumstances conspire against us and we begin to doubt that he's a father, that he loves, that he cares. Our experience perhaps of our own fathers or our experience of just life makes us question why did this happen to me maybe god is is punishing me oh no no a thousand times no and satan of course will jump on this too and he will try to warp our view of god let me just ask you a test question who do you pray to your great privilege is that you get to call the Father, Father. Somebody said to me recently that they had noticed that uh, because of their own experiences and their own experience with their own father growing up, that they had developed a, a, almost a distrust of God as Father. And they said the thing that, that flagged it up for them was, I was addressing my prayers to God. And he had the, 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 the wit and the wisdom to realize that, that this was a problem. And they was able to, to diagnose it. So how do you see God? This should change how you see God. It should ch change how you see life. You, how you see life. You live in a fa your father's world. Now do you believe that? Do you believe it? There are trials to go through. There are difficulties to face. There are disappointments to be to be taken on board. But everything that comes our way comes from the hand of a good and kind Father who has our best interests at heart. We need to believe that so that we can cope with the things that come our way. It changes how, how we see life and we, we miss out on things or whenever our bodies are falling apart we think, I've only got one life and look at it, it's, it's, been, it's, it's been impacted by stuff. And I'm missing out. Well, we have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil or fade. We have the new heavens and the new earth and everything made new. A gift to us from our Father. It changes everything. It changes, thirdly, how we see ourselves. In a world of low esteem. Where people seek self-esteem. In all sorts of useless, fruitless places. You can look and say, I have been loved with an everlasting love. Almighty God has set his love. I mean, it's not self-esteem that you need. It's, it's to know God's esteem of you. He delights in you as a son, as a daughter. Transforms how you see yourself. And it transforms how you see obedience. It's not a chore or a drag. Obedience is our determination to do nothing that will dishonor the family name. It's our determination to do nothing to dishonor the family name. There's a story I came across years ago of a Polish prince. And he carried a, a little portrait of his, his father, the king, around with him. And at particular moments he would take it out and look at it. And he would say, let me do nothing unbecoming so excellent a father. Let me do nothing unbecoming so excellent a father he didn't want to let his father down ah my friends how this should transform how we see obedience Lord don't let me do anything that would dishonor you 
Don't let me do anything that would drag the family name through the dirt. Let me finish with a question or two. This should impact our lives. Do we understand and value our adoption? Do you need to correct your view of God? I think we always need to correct. Because we always are moving one way or another, seeing him as, as a slave driver or as a distant a deity. We need to correct noise of Father. How will I remind myself of this privilege? How are you going to remind yourself of this privilege? Maybe you take this sheet and you use it to fuel your prayers over the coming week. Do I understand and value my adoption? Behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Amen.